the very hard thing that we are going to tackle this morning is this wonderful word called forgiveness. Everybody say forgiveness. forgiveness. Turn to your neighbor and say, you probably need to forgive somebody. Now turn to the, your second choice and say, I forgive you. <laughs> okay. All right, just wanted to get you guys alive and awake this morning. So basically, as I prepare for this message, um, we're going to just answer some questions. Forgiveness is one of those things that's kind of deceptive because if we're holding unforgiveness, um, a lot of times we're not aware of it. So we're going to talk about that, kind of unpack the anatomy of what forgiveness looks like, what the Bible says about it. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to challenge, challenge all of us this morning, and I, I believe it will be helpful. So anytime forgiveness is needed, it's because two people come into contact with one another and a loss occurs. So whether it be marriage relationship, uh, you know, family relationship, business relationship, anytime you have a conversation with somebody and expectations aren't met and, or you're offended or hurt or pain or disappointment, anytime that happens where somebody doesn't live up to our expectation, we experience loss, then there's a need for forgiveness. Um, and so there are two characters in this uh, scenario. There is the person who is violated and there's the violator, right? That's the best way I can you know, describe it. There's the violated and the violator, the person who perpetrated the loss and the person who experienced the loss. So we all track in this morning, I'm trying to use words you know, that we understand. Um, so anytime that happens, there's an opportunity for forgiveness. The word means to forgive or to forego or to give something to somebody that they may not deserve, right? And so we all, probably every 15 minutes of our lives on planet earth have opportunity to forgive. You might have had opportunity as you were driving here this morning and someone cut you off and you wanted to tell them that they're number one, right? And <laughs> instead you chose to forgive on the way to church, way to go. So here's some different examples of opportunities to forgive, right? Uh, a parent, maybe when you were a child, a parent has, had abandoned you, or maybe you had a spouse that's cheated on you, or a family member who has abused you. These are some heavy, heavy opportunities for forgiveness. Maybe a business partner who stole from you has done you wrong. Uh, a friend who told you lies, wasn't honest with you, or maybe a, a close friend who's rejected you for somebody else. Maybe you feel like God has let you down. You had expectations that God was going to do A, B, C in your life, and it didn't work out how you expected, and so maybe you're harboring resentment towards God. Maybe sickness has hit you in a way that you didn't think was fair. Maybe you lost a loved one, and death in your life has brought you to the point where you're like, that's not fair, and so now you're harboring this resentment and this, this bitterness that has a tendency to grab our hearts or... Maybe someone in your household didn't fold the cereal bag all the way down before they closed the box. I mean, that's like major, right? Or maybe you have a spouse that squeezes the toothpaste in the middle instead of from the bottom. I don't know if they deserve forgiveness, but we, you know, we'll pray through. So we've all experienced infractions, loss. We've all experienced difficulty, disappointment, pain. And we all have had opportunities where we have... Forgiveness required of us where we're going to forgive others and also where we're asking for forgiveness ourselves. We've been both the violated and the violator. And in some instances, we're both at the same time where we per, uh, perpetuate actions ourselves that are, are bad or terrible. And we look at ourselves and we say, man, how could you do that? You're such an idiot. And all of a sudden we fall into self-hatred. I've actually fallen into that before, where I have become the violator and the violated, and I hate myself because of what I've done. In all of these cases, forgiveness is on the menu. How many of you have experienced some of these things that I have shared? Just real quick, a show of hands. There should be just about everybody. Okay. Um, so when we experience them, why is forgiving so difficult? How many of you know that's the true statement? Forgiveness is not easy. When someone has done us wrong or we've experienced any sort of pain or loss or disappointment and forgiveness is required of us as the violated, why is forgiveness so difficult? Well, I'm so glad you asked. I'm going to give you some four reasons. There's probably a hundred. I'm just going to give you four reasons why forgiving is so hard. 
And the first one, the first reason forgiving is very difficult is because of good old-fashioned pride. Forgiving is hard because of pride. Because when somebody does something against us, towards us, that we don't understand, we instantly think, I would never do that. I would never desert you. I would never hurt you in the way you've hurt me. I would never say to you what you said to me. I can't believe that. And so subconsciously, we literally think we are better than them because we would never do that. That's what pride is. Pride elevates ourselves above somebody else. We think we're better than them because on our worst day, we would never do that. And pride is the base, one of the base reasons for unforgiveness. Unforgiveness can only stay if there's pride there. If you're humble, if you, if you uh, have humility working in your life, it's almost impossible for unforgiveness to stay there. But pride is the seedbed. It's like the Petri dish for unforgiveness to grow. You might be sitting here today, maybe you have a person or a face in your mind that you, this day, Sunday morning, you might think, man, I am holding unforgiveness towards this this person. And you might even say, you're right, Pastor James, I am better than them. They are a terrible person. They are like really rotten. And you don't have any problem uh, believing that you're a better person than the person who has done you wrong. And uh, I would just maybe submit to you today that what the Bible says is that God resists the proud. That maybe in your resentment, your bitterness, your unforgiveness, God has backed up off your business because of that pride. The Bible says that God gives grace to the humble, but he resists the proud. And so when we're sitting in our unforgiveness and we think we're better than other people, God is like, man, I really want to get in there, but the stench of your pride is keeping me away. Failure to forgive is the smoke evidence of the fire of pride. You know the saying, where there's smoke, there's fire. Where there's unforgiveness, there's pride, 100% of the time. But you don't know what they did, Pastor James. You don't know what that person's done to me. You don't know how they hurt me. You don't know how they abused me. You're right, I don't know. But I do know how God has forgiven you. I do know that. And therein lies the rub, right? We have this all-amazing, all-powerful God who has chosen to forgive us. And yet, we wrestle with forgiving other people. So the first reason forgiving is so difficult, number one, is pride. Number two, forgiving is very difficult because not forgiving is delicious. (laughs) My dad told me that one time. He said, James, unforgiveness is delicious. How many of you know that when you hold on to resentment and unforgiveness, it just feels so good, doesn't it? I know this sounds, you don't want to admit it. It feels wrong to admit, but if there was nobody else in the room and we were really honest with ourselves, unforgiveness is delicious. It feels really good to be able to think we're better than them because there's, we have a hard evidence of what they've done and what they said. We have every right to withhold our forgiveness from them because it tastes so good because they don't deserve our forgiveness. We want them to experience the pain and loss we have felt, and so we're going to let them have it. It's delicious. Reason number three, forgiving is difficult. Forgiving is hard because it forces us to trust God. Forgiveness forces us to trust God. Here's how. Because if I let that person off the hook, I'm trusting that they're going to have to stand before God for what they did. And the problem is we don't trust that God is able. We don't trust that God is just, right? We know that God is forgiving because he's forgiven us, but we don't believe that God is just because we're not really sure if if they're really going to answer for all of the wrong they did. And you know what? Keeping tabs and holding on to resentment and keeping score and withholding affection and thinking bad thoughts and defriending people on Facebook, all of that is exhausting. It is way easier to release people from my judgment and say, okay, Lord, you deal with them. Do you really trust God to deal with the people who have done you wrong? That's what it looks like. That's what forgiveness looks like. It's saying, Lord, I am trusting you. I'm trusting your ability. I'm trusting that you, are, you can handle the situation. My only recourse is to release them in forgiveness. Reason number four. Reason number four, forgiving is so hard and difficult, is because we don't have a strong why. 
We don't have a strong why. Last week, I talked about prayer. And I think one of the reasons, and I shared it last week, one of the reasons we wrestle with a consistent prayer life is we don't have a strong why. And I did my very best to lay a foundation as to why prayer is absolutely necessary and uh, required, and there's so many benefits, but I kind of did my best to lay that, and I believe I did an okay job. But, but why forgive? You might be sitting here, and you could probably list two or three people that you might have resentment or unforgiveness towards, or maybe you're oblivious, and it's hidden, and you have totally forgotten about it because it happened 20 years ago, and it's not something and you think about every day, and so you're like, yeah, yeah, I don't see them, and so I don't worry about it, but if I were to start digging, or if that person were to walk into the room, all of a sudden, whoop, something would come up, some, right, some heart issue, some, some unforgiveness, some resentment, some bitterness would, you know, poke its ugly head up, so I want to do my best again. I'm going to put my teacher hat. I want to give you three reasons why we should forgive, three reasons. Reason number one, because not forgiving will kill you. <laughs> it is absolutely true. So I want to back it up with, uh, I read an article this week from the Johns Hopkins Medical, uh, Medical website. So this is, it's a, an article on forgiveness by Johns Hopkins Medical, one of America's leading health enterprises. It's not a Christian organization. It is a strictly medical uh, article. And so this is what it says. It says, whether it's a simple spat with your spouse or a long-held resentment toward a family member or friend, unresolved conflict can go deeper than you may realize. It may be affecting your physical health. The good news, studies have found that the act of forgiveness can reap huge rewards for your health, lowering the risk of a heart attack, improving cholesterol levels in sleep, and reducing pain, blood pressure, and levels of anxiety, depression, and stress. And research points to an increase in the forgiveness health connection as you age. Quote, there is an enormous physical burden to being hurt and disappointed, says Dr. Karen Schwartz, director of the Mood Disorders Adult Consultation Clinic at the Johns Hopkins Hospital. She goes on to say, chronic anger puts you into a fight or flight mode, which results in numerous changes in the heart rate, blood pressure, and immune response. Those changes then increase the risk of depression, heart disease, and diabetes, among other conditions. Forgiveness, however, calms stress levels, leading to improved health. That's like a medical article, like legit, way beyond my education. Doctors are saying, hey, one of the best things you can do for your health is to forgive. Reason number one, I'm trying to build a case as to why, because sometimes when unforgiveness weasels its way deep down in our heart, we don't have a strong enough why to really walk in forgiveness. So I'm giving you one reason. Holding on to unforgiveness and resentment is literally, according to that article, literally like drinking poison and hoping it kills someone else, right? Have you ever maybe heard that before? You've heard that quote? Unforgiveness is like drinking poison and hope it hurt, hoping it hurts the other person. When literally it physically is, is killing you physically, hurting your own body. Reason number two. Now, this is kind of a Sunday school answer, and you might expect it. Reason number two to forgive, because the Bible says so. There are so many passages in the scripture about uh, forgiveness. I want to just give you two of them. Ephesians 4.32. These are very powerful. So Paul the apostle writes the church in Ephesus. And he's given them instruction. He says, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another, just as Christ, just as in Christ, God forgave you. That's Ephesians 4.32. So forgive one another in the same way that you have been forgiven. And the second one is Colossians 3.13. Paul, again, writing, he says, bearing with one another and forgiving one another, if anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. In other words, we have been given the greatest example of forgiveness that this universe has ever seen. And the greatest example is God, how he forgives us. So as we read the script of how God forgives us, that's our model to forgiving others. Any other level or any other model of forgiveness is incomplete and inadequate compared to how God has forgiven us. That's how we're called. That's why Paul said, in the same way, just as Christ has forgiven us, in the same way, we should forgive other people. All right, you guys tracking with me so far? All right. Notice that this passage is written in the past tense. As Christ has 
forgiven. It's in the past tense, right? So we are already forgiven of, of, of our sins. Does that make sense? All right. So that's actually reason number three. The reason number three to forgive as to why is because we have been forgiven. We have been forgiven. So I really wrestled with how to unpack this in a way because last week we talked about one of the things we pray is, Lord, forgive me. And why should we pray, Lord, forgive me if we're already forgiven? And so I, I stumbled across a story online that really helps kind of um, unpack it. And I want to read it to you. And I believe it'll be helpful. So this is, I just call this the watch story. All right. So suppose that just before I began to preach t- this morning, I uh, took off my watch and I laid it here on the pulpit, and I forgot it was here, and then I walked away. And someone in the back noticed that I left it on the pulpit, um, and he makes his way down to the platform or to the stage uh, after service, and seeing that nobody sees him, uh, slips it in his pocket and walks away, right? You following the story so far? However, somebody saw him. We'll call him the, the thief. We'll call him John. Sorry if your name is John here this morning. It's just a, I'm not talking about you. You didn't steal my watch, Okay. Um, so the person saw John take it and they informed me, Hey, John, I saw John take your watch off the podium and I'm looking for it. Right. So naturally I'm, uh, I'm surprised. I'm disappointed, but I choose in my heart to forgive John because I know John, I love John. And even though whatever was going on in John's life, he needed my watch. And so I, I forgive him in my heart. Once I deal with any negative feelings that I have, there's no barrier in my relationship with John as far as I'm concerned. My relationship with him has not changed. Even though he stole my watch, I have forgiven him for his actions. I have canceled the debt. I have assumed the loss. And when I see him the following Sunday, I don't say, hey, John, you stole my watch. I've forgiven him. And so I've got to trust the Lord to deal with John. You tracking with me so far? Okay. But suppose John discovers that I'm aware that he took my watch. By coincidence, we meet in a hallway, and it's just the two of us, and I say, hey, John, how are you? I'm glad to see you. You see, I am free because I've forgiven him. I'm not carrying the excess emotional weight of an unforgiving spirit, bitterness, or resentment for his action. But what do you suppose is going on on the inside of John? He feels guilty, embarrassed, ashamed, fearful, regretful, exposed. I give him a warm, friendly handshake, uh, because, and I smile. I even invite him to lunch. But he nervously excuses himself. His eyes are unable to meet mine, and he hurries off. He's miserable. His conscience is gnawing at him. His smile and his sense of humor are totally gone. The only way he's going to be comfortable around me is, and have fellowship with me again is to clear his conscience by confessing to me that he stole my watch and asking for forgiveness. My reply would then be, you're already forgiven. I forgave you even before I knew who took my watch. He did not have to come to me to get forgiveness. He was already forgiven. His confession was necessary for him to clear his conscience and for him to be restored to his previous fellowship with me. That is what happens when we come to God confessing our sin. The confession does not persuade God to forgive us. He already did that on the cross. The confession restores us to our previous level of fellowship and intimacy with him from our perspective. God did not change. He did not turn away from us because of our sin. His love was not affected. He was not disappointed. He already knows about the sins we are yet going to commit. And his response is the same every time. You are already forgiven. Clears things up, doesn't it? There's the violator and the violated. Every time we sin, we violate God's law. I know we don't think of it that way, but we sin against God first before we ever sin against anybody else. We are the violator and he is the violated. And every time we do that, he says the same thing. You're forgiven. I forgive you. I forgive you. I forgive you. But what happens is we walk around on planet earth for years at a time with broken fellowship with God. Because of guilt, shame, resentment, condemnation, all of these things that we're carrying on our end. And the whole time, God is saying, you're forgiven. Will you just come home? Will you stop letting the effects of sin eat your lunch? This is why forgiveness is so huge. Because there's two parts to it. And if you're here today and you are weighed down in your heart by unforgiveness, this, one of the simplest things you can do is say, God, I thank you 
for forgiving me when I violated your law. That your forgiveness towards me is free flowing. I cannot out sin your forgiveness because it's already done and settled. And that's the model. That's how we forgive those who do us wrong. I've shared with friends before who are heading in, into a situation where uh, there might be loss, right? Whether it's a business deal, whether it's a, a close relationship where, you know, tensions are high. And I've shared with my friends before, I'd say, listen, load some, load some grace bullets in your gun. In other words, be ready to offer forgiveness and grace as soon as the infraction occurs, as soon as loss happens. Be ready to forgive. Why? Because that's the model that we were shown. That's how God has chosen to forgive us. Once you see things from that perspective, it kind of changes a lot, doesn't it? Who do you identify with in the story of the watch? You don't have to answer out loud, but just think. Do you, do you identify with me, the, the person whose watch was stolen? Then it could be that somebody has taken something from you and you've experienced loss in your life and you're holding on uh, and your, 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 your heart is weighed down with the ramifications of resentment. Or maybe you identify with John, not because your name is John, but maybe you identify with somebody and you're like, man, I've done somebody wrong and they haven't forgiven me and I'm walking around with the weight of this on my life. The truth is, in life, we have, we have occupied the seat of the violator We've occupied the seat of the violated. And the best thing we can do is walk in grace towards people. Jesus is the greatest example of forgiveness that the universe has ever seen. The Bible says that while we were yet sinners, so think of it. Sinning in the present, in front of God, our sin, just gross, ugly, all sin will be paid for, right? But those in Jesus, those who have accepted Christ, our sin is paid for by him. Those who haven't accepted that gift of forgiveness in Jesus, they're going to have to pay for their own sin. That's the difference between a Christian and a non-Christian, is just who's paying for the sin. Us Christians, our sin is paid for. We have the benefit of walking in incredible forgiveness all the days of our life. We get to be dispensers of forgiveness to whoever does us wrong, no matter what. Now, that's hard. That's difficult. But it's what we're called to. And this sermon in the series is not do easy things. It's called do hard things. And sometimes forgiving is not easy. Part of salvation and what we talk about, about being a Christian, the first step is saying, Jesus, I believe that you died for me 2,000 years ago. I believe that my sin has broken your law and I'm guilty. I'm not so proud and arrogant to think that I'm good enough on my own. I have sinned. I have broken your commandments. I have messed up and I don't want to pay for my own sin. Jesus, will you be the one who pays for my sin? I receive your free gift of forgiveness and salvation. What a great gift. Can you imagine? That's the only way God can be just and merciful at the same time. Because if you think about it, justice and mercy, they cannot coexist. Perfect justice requires that some, every sin be paid for. And perfect mercy requires that the people who committed the sin don't get the judgment. And the only way God can be just and merciful at the same time is because of Jesus.